Hello everyone. Uh, in preparation for our um, forthcoming summary assignment, I want to take a little bit of time and talk about plagiarism, citations, some things to expect from that. So uh, let's go ahead and begin with a discussion of what is plagiarism, just in general. Um, you've seen this defined, I know this is kind of a review, um, but I just want to make sure that we're being very clear on this subject. Plagiarism is using somebody else's ideas in a work such as a paper and claiming that they're your own. Um, plagiarism can also happen when you um, use uh, images um, and claim that you, they're your own using music, using all kinds of things, but we're going to focus mostly right now on plagiarism in terms of essays. Okay, so plagiarism can be accidental or deliberate. Um, either one is still considered plagiarism. It can be any length of a passage. Um, plagiarism can be exact words or similar sentences. And it also can be ideas or words. So it doesn't have to just be exact phrasing. If you're, you're using somebody else's ideas, you still need to um, make sure that you are not plagiarizing them. Okay, so in an English composition class such as ours, accidental plagiarism is seen as a cause for concern. Um, when you make an accident, we, we want to make sure that we're calling attention to it, and um, we use that as kind of a teaching moment to try to get you to understand what's going on in that particular instance. Deliberate plagiarism, of course, is something different, and it, that's seen as a problem. Um, and there, there are usually a, a strong difference between the two. Um, most of the time we assume accidental plagiarism, but you can usually tell when somebody's deliberately taking from somebody else's ideas. Um, schools today use a software that searches the internet and tells your instructors if any um, assignments that have been turned in match anything else on the internet or anything previously turned into the college. So we do get a report from this. Um, you should be aware that Pikes Peak Community College and all other colleges in the area use um, a software program that can tell you, um, that can tell your instructors um, if you've turned in anything that's um, coming from even those, those sites where you can pay for your papers. So what this means is, is that students should be very careful to avoid plagiarizing. You want to make sure that you're using your own words, your own ideas. It's really important. Okay, so one way that you can avoid plagiarizing is by understanding citation. Um, understanding citation allows you to protect yourself against um, plagiarism. So we've talked a little bit about what plagiarism is. Let's talk a little bit more in depth about what citation is. Okay, so citation is, at its heart, a specialized shorthand that just gives your readers specific information about source material. The kinds of information that are included in every kind of citation um, is things like where the original material was found, who created this initial material, what it's called, if it was a print or an online material, various other information. Um, the in-text citation, there's two kinds. There's the in-text and there's a citation list at the end of the paper. Um, both of these are important. They need to um, refer to one another. So the in-text citation is shorter, but it tells um, your reader how to find the information at the very end of your paper. Okay, so that's a, a very brief overview about what citation is. It's a um, kind of a stripped down definition. But let's talk a little bit more about why cite. We're going to get into information about um, how to cite as well, and we will be doing some practice. But for the moment, let's, let's stick with why cite. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this earlier. Citation is how responsible and respectful writers safeguard against plagiarism. So it's both a way to protect yourself and it's also a way to allow you to show um, that you are a credible writer and that you're respectful of the conventions that happen in um, academic writing. 
Writers off also, as I just mentioned, show respect for an academic con convention by adhering to its standards. Okay, so it's showing that you can play by the rules. You also show respect for your readers by providing research resources. This allows the readers and you know, writers who are looking over your material to continue the conversation. That whole academic conversation we started talking about in the very beginning. This is really important. We want to make sure that um, this conversation is not just something that gets left, but something that gets continued. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what to cite. Okay, so what you have to cite. Responsible and respectful writers always cite other people's ideas no matter what the format, no matter how long the passage. Um, so you have to um, cite all of these items, and these are ways to incorporate other people's ideas. You have to cite a direct quotation. You have to cite a paraphrased passage. You have to cite a summary of somebody else's writing. So this, as you can see, plays into our assignment this week. You're going to be since we're working on our summary, you actually are going to have to make sure that you are citing both paraphrase passages and summaries entirely about somebody else's writing. Okay, so what you, that is what you have to cite, what you don't have to cite. You don't have to cite your own thoughts, your observations from your own personal experience, and experimental results that you yourself have done, unless they were previously published. Okay? So, for example, I don't have to cite this. I can state my own personal opinions about Colorado weather or the way that I directly observe people reacting to it. Um, if I use these in a paper, I do still have to detail my observations, how I came to hold my opinions, but I don't have to cite myself. It would be very difficult to cite, um, since citing gives our readers how you can find this information, doing that when it's your own personal idea would be very, very tedious, to say the least. Some other things you don't have to cite. What's called common knowledge. Um, a few things fall under this. Um, standard information, and I'll explain what that is. Folk literature. Um, also common sense observations. These don't have to be cited. Okay, so I don't have to cite standard information, like historic dates. Um, the American Revolutionary War happened from 1775 to 1783. I don't have to cite that. I don't have to cite, you know, holiday dates, things like that. These are called standard information because they're generally known. But I do have to cite interpretations, theories, or discoveries not commonly known or commonly accepted. So this historian is talking about the Revolutionary War. Um, according to historian Elizabeth Collins, many key community figures, including George Washington, opposed the arming of slaves during the American Re Revolutionary War. I've got that in-text citation right after because this actually um, provides information about something that she's written. Okay, I also don't have to cite folk literature. Um, if it's specifically not connected with an author. So for example, the short fable Little Red Riding Hood contains a big bad wolf, a girl dressed in red, and a grandmother. Okay, this is very generic. Um, I'm not going to a specific um, document to find this information. I just kind of know this from my own experience. But if I were to use a re um, this specific folk literature that was connected with an author because there are several people who have written different accounts of Little Red Riding Hood. In this case, Charles Perrault, you may be familiar with the Grimm's version, but um, in Charles Perrault's retelling of Little Red Riding Hood, the girl is consumed by the wolf with no hope of being saved. So this specifically is related to Perrault's writing, so therefore, again, I have to include my citation here. Hey, I don't have to help cite commonly held opinions. So, and this gets a little tricky because what a commonly held opinion has to be something that everyone would agree on. Um, so the American dream has long been considered a motivating factor to the, in the economic life of the American public. Now, if somebody didn't agree with that, um, that the American dream was something, I would have to actually start looking some research. 
Okay, I do have to cite references to opinions in this case. So Tim Stanley notes the differences portrayed in American television families over, his, over time in his essay, The Changing Face of the American Family. Since this is talking about a very specific essay um, and his opinion, it's still connected to that author. All right, so I hope I've given you some ideas of what you do, don't have to cite, why you would want to cite, um, why it pr protects you from plagiarism. And we're going to move on to talking about when to cite. Okay, so when you must cite. At the very first mention um, in text when you're writing a paper, the very first time you mention the writer's ideas, that's the time that you need to cite. Okay. If you switch to a different writer's ideas or a different section of the same writer's ideas, you should cite. So if you're switching page numbers or um, chapters or anything like that, or if you're going to move to a different writer altogether, you have to cite again. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example here. This is a, another um, example of in-text citation. Um, Michael Benson raises several salient points regarding a NASA policy, and then I've got my page number in parentheses here. Um, because I have um, Michael Benson's name in this part of the um, this citation, I don't actually have to put it on in the in-text citation here. Um, Benson advocates that space exploration be more bold. Further, he condemns the current space exploration policy as absurd. And again, because his name is here, I don't have to put this here, uh, put his name in the citation at the end. If this just said, he advocates that space exploration be more bold, then I would need to put Benson um, space and then the page number. Okay? So now that we've talked a little bit about all the times that you could, um, all the whens, the whys, um, we need to talk about, of course, how do you cite. Um, it's really important to know exactly how this is supposed to look when you're incorporating your sources in text. So, of course, some, some ways to incorporate sources. There are direct quotations, there is paraphrase, there is summary. You should make sure that you're aware of how you use all of those. We will um, not be using direct quotations for our summary. Um, you will be using paraphrases or just general summaries on the whole. Um, but I do want to make sure I cover this for um, future essays because once we get to the argument, you will be using some direct quotations. Okay, so why do you use a direct quotation? You only want to use a direct quotation when the original wording is perfect, okay? So it's not when you're just trying to get the gist of the passage, what what the passage really means is what I mean by gist. Um, when the wording is perfect, it just matches everything that you want, okay? When you're using direct quotations, only use one or two per paragraph at most err on the side of fewer quotations because most of the time your instructors really do want to hear from you. Um, they want to know what's going on with your thinking rather than whether or not you can artfully arrange somebody else's words. So fewer quotations, one or two per paragraph at most. And this block quotation idea, quotations of four or more lines are called block quotations and we do have that in our formatting assignment for the week but they should be used very rarely if ever so in a paper of about 10 pages no more than one block quotation if you um, once you get to grad school and you start using um, you know starting to write 20 to 30 page papers you can probably have two but really you should minimize those block quotations Okay, and as we've talked about earlier, a paraphrase is a short, in-depth passage based on somebody else's ideas in which you use your own words entirely. So this is a paraphrase it is really helpful actually to restate and redefine complex information. Um, so if there's a complex procedure that you need to discuss or define, paraphrase is a really great way to do it because sometimes you 
only need a little bit of that information for the reader to understand where you're coming from. So you can paraphrase a paragraph or so short section. Paraphrases are about the same length as the original passage. Okay, so um, you won't be paraphrasing a really long essay or and you won't be paraphrasing like a book or anything like that. So this is going to be very short. Okay, and then the last of course is a summary which is what we're working on now. This condenses somebody else's ideas and again it uses your own words entirely. You can summarize chapters, sections, entire books. The, the pieces that you pick out to summarize um, depending on how long your paper is you're going to want to make sure that you're concentrating only on the most important parts. And though we are you know working on a summary for this week's assignment the thing to remember is all of our essays are going to involve summary to some point because you're going to have to summarize what other people have said before you can make your argument about what what it means. Okay but no matter if you, you're going to use direct quotations, paraphrases, or summaries you have to cite. Okay, you are always going to cite, right? <clears throat> and I'm going to show you what that looks like. We are going to talk a little bit real quick about signal phrases. Um, these are one way that you can use to make sure that your readers understand that you are um, ideas coming forward are different um, from there are your ideas versus the, the ideas that are coming forth from your papers. Signal phrases let you know which are which. So they're very important to use when you write so your reader always knows which ideas belong to you and which ideas belong to your research. Okay, so a couple of examples we have here are like according to the author's name goes here. Clive Thompson argues, Cynthia Haven and Josh Keller point out. Um, so you probably, a lot of people use these intuitively, but um, it's really good to just start incorporating these all the time in your um, in your papers at this point. There are tons of examples of signal phrases and um, I will give you some more templates for this, but your Little Brown Handbook does have some great examples on page 644. Okay, so while we would never take any quotate, quotation out of context, or alter it in any way, we may need to smooth out some of the wording in order to make it fit grammatically in the sentence. Okay, and I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, we can do this with very specific formatting for omitting words, substituting or adding to maintain grammar or syntax, and we're not going to change the meaning, we're only going to try to make it fit into our sentence so it's not confusing and it's, it's less clunky. Okay, so if you have to admit uh, excuse me, omit words in a quote. Um, the uh, We've got this little passage at the bottom. It says, in Shakespeare's sonnet 73, the speaker identifies with the trees of late autumn, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet bird sang, line four, that's the um, citation. In me, Shakespeare writes, thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, and then there's the citation again because it's changing the line numbers. Okay, but this passage, um, the writer who's talking about this passage is only talking about the trees of late autumn rather than talking about the rest of the poem. Okay, so um, you're going to go ahead and use an ellipsis, which is the, those three periods to state that the, the writing goes on, but we're not going to talk about that. All right, so we're not taking it out of context. We're only just we're going to focus on a specific part of it. Okay, and then this one, um, on some occasions, you may have to add something to the quotation that was referenced previously in the writing. Um, I've given an example down here at the bottom. Um, without this information, the quotation might not actually make much sense. So these additions where you're going to add your own voice, you're going to put them in square brackets, which are kind of right above, um, above and to the left of your enter key. So in the following quotation, without the addition of human beings in brackets, the reader might not understand what Thomas is getting at. So in this case, it says we human beings worry away our lives. Okay, so rather than just say we worry away our lives, well, who's we? Um, in this case, the um, the writer of this passage is trying to make sure that you as the reader can follow what they're saying. 
Okay, so there's, there's one thing that we may have to do. Something else we might have to do is um, change capitalization of an initial quote. So um, in this next example I've got here, uh, the worrying animal is what Thomas calls us. Uh, he says we worry away our lives. So um, the the here was initially just lowercase, but we need to make it a capital to, to fit this sentence. So you're going to bracket the T just to make sure that it, it looks correct. And then in this other one, we worry away our lives. We um, here is um, was initially uppercase, as we remember from our previous slide. So to make that lowercase, you're going to bracket the W. If you have questions about this, I know it can seem kind of complicated, um, but if you have complications, please just, um, or any questions or anything, you're going to make sure you let us know, let me know, um, or speak to the Writing Center. One of us can give you a hand with that. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of what we, how, how we cite. Okay, so different disciplines of study use different formats for citation and this can be confusing to some people. They're very similar in content but they're different in form. Um, this form comp corresponds to different emphases within each discipline and without getting into the details too much, um, various disciplines like APA, um, the American Psychological Association, they tend to focus on more social science research. Um, and we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. All right, APA used by the American Psychological Association for Psychology and Social Sciences. MLA format is the Modern Language Association and it's used generally for arts and humanities. Chicago or Turabian is often used for history or graduate studies. Um, there are tons of um, formats, okay? There are a lot of other formats that get used. Um, these are, um, so, there are some examples in the back of your little brown handbook if you want to take a peek at them. Um, let me give you um, just some idea about the same resource formatted in three different ways. So if you were doing an APA format, this would be what um, Elizabeth Collins would look like. Um, notice that the first name is not emphasized and um, it uses a reference page. Okay, MLA format, same thing, uses the complete name, a little bit more expanded, tells you exactly where it was found. <coughs> uh, Chicago, um, rather than works cited or referenced, uses a bibliography page and gets even a little bit longer, which is why you can see that history and, and or graduate studies would be interested in this. Okay, and if you're interested in looking um, for citation sources, um, the Little Brown Handbook gives you um, chapter 46 is using MLA documentation and format. Um, there are uh, additional chapters about um, APA and other formatting, um, and I believe Chicago and I think CSE as well in your Little Brown Handbook. The inquiry text also offers some information about citing and documenting sources and our library offers this wonderful resource called Moodle Tools which will help you check your formatting if you're not sure. Sometimes I am asked about um, online uh, citation generators or Microsoft Word or any of the other word processing programs generators. The thing is, is you can use that to um, track your information, but you don't want to rely on that as a final source. It actually, um, they can be, they're machine generated, it's not like they're being generated by a person, and they can be very wrong. Um, so you need to know what they look like, you need to know what the capitalization for everything looks like, um, because if you don't, then it just looks like you're, you're not taking the time to be respectful of the convention. So use these tools but kind of have an idea that you're going to need to spend some time on this. Citation work does take quite a bit of time unfortunately. All right, so that's the basics on plagiarism and citation and kind of how to protect yourself from it. I hope you're getting a better idea through your reading and through the lectures how you actually go about um, protecting yourself by doing in-text citation and end of uh, the end of your paper resources. But once again, please stay in touch with me if I can answer any questions. Thanks and good luck.